Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good middle of the night, it looks like as well, given some of the places some of you are logging in from. It's wonderful to uh, see so many of you joining us again for this latest in our Innovation at Work webinar series, uh, brought to you from MIT Sloan Executive Education. Uh, this is our deep dive version of, of this uh, webinar, at, in which I am delighted to be joined uh, by my colleague, Paul McDonough smith uh, who is going to be telling us about his work uh, in the area of, and indeed a new executive education program that he's been developing uh, with the title of Business Implications of Extended Reality, abbreviated to uh, XR, uh, which you'll probably hear us say quite a lot during the course of the next hour or so. Uh, Paul uh, is an accomplished executive uh, in his own right with a background in telecommunications and technology before he uh, started working with us as a partner at MIT Sloan. Uh, executive education, where he was really one of uh, our drivers of many innovations in the digital uh, learning and online uh, learning uh, space. Uh, and uh, we've been working together for over a decade uh, on not only these technologies, uh, but these new approaches to thinking about and implementing uh, learning and, uh, and, and development. So uh, I'm really thrilled that Paul uh, is uh, stayed with us for all of this time. I'm even more thrilled that he's been able to find time uh, to share with us today uh, some insights into this latest work. Uh, today, he's going to uh, help us understand uh, some definitions around uh, extended reality terminology. Uh, he's going to help us understand what are the real business applications of these technologies. Uh, and he's going to share some insights onto uh, what this all means uh, for us. We will, uh, as is usual, have plenty of time at the end for, for questions. So please do feel free uh, during the course of the uh, of the talk as well. Don't wait till the end to post questions in the Q&A uh, function. And uh, I will come back later and read through those questions and uh, help Paul to uh, to answer as many of those for you uh, as we can. Uh, so put your questions in the Q&A. But if you have other sorts of comments that you just want to share, you can also use the chat. We're going to leave that open uh, as well. So with that, let me uh, hand over to Paul. Please uh, please come up onto the stage, Paul, and uh, uh, tell us more. Well, thank you. Th th thank you, Peter, and th thank you, team. And um, th thank you all, of course, uh, as Peter said, for, for joining uh, during your mornings, your afternoons, evenings, and as Peter said, the nighttime as well. We, we really do appreciate that you take the time to join us and to actually share with each other your observations and your insights around the topic at hand, extended reality today, through the chat um, and text kind of opportunities. And, and then also, as Peter said, we'll leave time at the end for uh, a question and answer session. So welcome to Extended Re Reality. Um, this talk, uh, this presentation over the next 40, 45 minutes, we're going to give you um, some intuitions for the way in which extended reality, its family of technologies function, the contribution that they can make to our teams, our organizations, and potentially society as, as well, and introduce some of the key implications as well as applications of these technologies. And so uh, a number of the things that we're going to talk about today uh, well, pretty much all of them, in fact, are talked about in greater detail in the programme that we're launching at the end of November. And so I think today um, we'll be hopefully provoking some interesting um, thoughts and getting you to reflect on some of the considerations. So what I wanted to do really over the next 40 minutes or so was to cover, uh, un uncover three key questions um, to get us thinking about these questions, um, thinking about their impact and their implications, particularly for each of our individual organizations. And, you know, starting to walk towards some of the potential factors that will influence the answering of these questions. So um, three very simple questions. We're going to talk about what is XR, um, why it's relevant today. And then the third question is to think about how we might think and act with extended realities today. And you'll, you'll see almost a common theme in, the, in these questions around uh, almost a, a presentism, a kind of focus on where we are today. 
As, as you will already be aware, XR technologies, whether it's AR, VR, mixed reality, MR, metaverse, uh, multiverse, digital twins, etc. Th these are all technologies that are evolving pretty quickly. And given all of your professional expertise, you, you will also be aware that it's, it's often very difficult or notoriously difficult to build a baseline strategy when things are, are moving so quickly. So by asking and hopefully answering these three questions to a degree, we aim to give you a bit of a baseline from which you can start to think about the ways in which you should be moving forward today. Um, we tend to be digital presentists um, as much as digital futurists here at MIT Sloan with a, with a bias for action today of thinking around what are the things that we can do today to move things forward, to create momentum in our teams so that tomorrow we'll be able to formulate the opportunities and actually deliver upon them as well. So these are the three questions I'm gonna to try to, to kind of introduce over the next 40 minutes. And whilst I'm grappling with these three questions, I'd like you to kind of think about what does all of this or what does some of this actually mean for me individually and then collectively for my team and organization. So be before, diving straight into extended reality and that family of technologies directly, I, I just wanted us to take a couple of steps back for a moment. Um, we live in very, very, um, very busy times. Um, we tend to always be racing forward. What, what I'd like to suggest is that we just take a couple of minutes to take, almost metaphorically, take a couple of steps back almost like those pointillism artists. You know, when, when you're too near to the mosaic, it can be difficult to make out the picture. So let's, let's take a couple of steps back and just reflect upon where we might actually be with te technology today. And so these few lines, the, these words that I've included here, are, are simply meant to provide some context to this conversation on extended reality. So on each of your desks, I'm, I'm pretty sure, you have your, your laptops, your computers, your smartphones, your iPads, tablets, et cetera, et cetera. And e each one of those, ladies and gentlemen, will be running uh, the code data algorithms that fundamentally is recalibrating, evolving the human and machine partnership. The way in which humans and machines are actually working and interacting together. Their roles, their relationships, their responsibilities, and ultimately the realities, which is what we're gonna focus upon today. And just to, as I said, take a couple of steps back from the mosaic so we can make out the colors and the contours a little bit more clearly, I'd like you just to, to think about these four R's, these roles, relationships, responsibilities, realities of your human and machine partnership. It can be your individual partnership with, with, with machines. It can be that of your team, that of your organization, or, or, or those of your, um, your networks of which you are no doubt a part. And when, when I think about roles, I'll just, for each of the four of these, I'll share just um, a very brief consideration that you can reflect upon and perhaps use associ associatively to think about the, the, the relationship you have with all, each of these individual R's. So when, when it comes to the roles within our human and machine partnership, I, I suppose in, in a number of ways, I, I was actually brought up very much on the, um, the Hans Moravec and Michael Polanyi type uh, ideas of paradox. You know, um, Moravec's paradox telling us that oftentimes what's complex for a, a machine is easier for humans and oftentimes what's complex for a human is easier for machines, almost helping us explain why um, we see machines and, and computers winning at Go, winning at poker, winning at chess, et cetera, et cetera. Helping us also understand why it is that um, a one-year-old human child has greater sensory motor skills than the vast majority of robots that we're able to, to build. So oftentimes what's complex for the machine, easier for the human and vice versa. And then Polanyi's paradox that reminds us that, or is often summarized by the line that we know more than we can tell. 
And so I sit here in my, in my office and I could explain to you in, in great detail the address of where I am, which room in the, in, in the house I'm actually sitting. But if I were to try to explain to you how I dropped my daughter off at school this morning, well, that would be much more difficult. Hinting at the complexity, often at coding tacit knowledge. And, and of course, these lines, uh, the lines of these paradoxes are becoming increasingly blurred with advances in a number of AI and machine intelligence fields, and, and, and also potentially in these XR fields as, as well. So as we look at the future, we can expect some of these paradoxes to be challenged or to be evolved, perhaps even. And I think one of the ways in which we might expect to see them develop is in the ways in which the human-centric skills and capabilities become very important in determining the success of the human and machine partnership. It, it, almost, it almost drives us into this second bullet point around the human and machine relationships. This idea of a double helix, um, borrowed from Watson and Crick, of, of course, this idea that the two uprights of our twisted ladder actually represent the physical and the digital worlds in which we all work and operate within today. And then the rungs of this ladder are actually the human-centric capabilities, the genes, the proteins that actually hold and bind the ladder together, together, give it its actual strength. And these rungs being those human-centric capabilities, things like creativity, curiosity, critical thinking, compassion, collaboration, and, and consilience, the, the, the concept of unity and unification, holding the ladder together and providing the foundations for this human and machine partnership to create robust, sustainable, profitable futures for our organizations as we move forward, representing that evolution in the roles that, that I was talking about a moment ago. And then, when it comes to responsibilities, just to think for a moment about the, the shared responsibilities that humans and machines have to create environments and contexts and domains and models, of course, that actually reflect a focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, fairness, trying to mitigate wherever possible cognitive, cultural and other types of biases that we see unfortunately being magnified at times within our algorithms. That's a shared and unified responsibility. And then this in itself, these three R's lead into a discussion around realities. I've, I've also already mentioned that when we talk about XR and its, its family of technologies, we openly admit that things are changing on a a monthly, if not weekly and daily basis in terms of the developments and advancements that we are seeing. What you're going to hear from me over the next 30 or 40 minutes is an introduction to some of the, some of the key elements and some of the key principles that sit behind those developments. And one of the things I'm going to try to, to, to put across is the significance of thinking about extended realities as part of a unified human reality as well, okay? So we're not going to be looking at XR in a vacuum, so to speak, but rather looking at it in terms of its relationships and its, its, its relationship and its hooks into our human realities and the way in which it can augment, extend and expand those realities. Okay, so, just to conclude this little section on context, um, what I'd like you to do as we, as we kind of journey through today's webinar is think about, reflect upon, explore some of the potential that you can see within your teams and your organizations for actually bringing the human and digital realities together. How can you, how can we, how can we actually bring them together, combine the capabilities in a complementary way that's going to provide positive impact and competitive advantage for your organizations? I'm going to, to posit, to, to argue, um, not surprisingly, that one of the key tenets here will be to experiment your way forward, 
to experiment with the family of XR technologies, to get to know these materials, to touch them, to pull back the curtain, pull up the hood, whatever metaphor we want to use, have a sense of how they function without needing to become experts in any ways, so that we have an appreciation of their implications and potential applications in our individual organizations. And then, in addition to exploring and experimenting the first two E's of our 3E model, we'll, we'll spend some time thinking about evolving how we sense and react or respond to this recalibrated human and machine reality, both with the actual XR technologies, but, but also the, the tools, the business models they offer, and the techniques that they make possible. So now, having provided a little bit of context and, uh, and background to introduce the idea of extended reality, let's get into the first of our key questions here. What, in fact, is XR? And to do this, we're going to, um, we're going to go on a little bit of a journey, everybody. Uh, we're gonna go back to the future. So uh, where I asked you a couple of minutes ago to take a couple of steps back from the mosaic, now I'm gonna ask you to step into your metaphorical DeLorean and kind of shoot back um, 10 years ago. Um, and it's actually 10 years almost to the day. I think it was 10, 10, 10 years ago yesterday that here at MIT Sloan, we launched one of our first experiments with uh, virtual reality and virtual worlds. And what we did was we, we conducted, it was around the time or in response to the Hurricane Sandy set of issues we experienced. And um, as we had a series of participants and students who couldn't make it to campus, you know, we had a certain number who were local to the region, um, local to Cambridge, others who had already traveled. But in the days leading up to our, our program on big data that we were teaching, we still had a number of participants who weren't able to travel or had issues around their travel to, 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 to Boston, to, to Cambridge. And so in response to this, we used this challenge as an opportunity for an experiment. And we, we started to build a virtual world. Uh, we, we spun up uh, an instance on Amazon Web Services, as, as you do. And we, we created a virtual world and we connected it into our physical classroom. We had, uh, in this hybrid experiment, we had 120 participants attending in person and another 70 actually attending virtually. And the idea was that the professors, uh, Sandy Pentland and Eric Brynjolfsson, were able to teach both the physically co-located participants, as well as those who were remote and virtually uh, logging in to the class. We set up the audio so that the people in the virtual space could ask questions and be heard by the participants in the physical space, and those questions answered by the professors, et cetera, to create a unified experience. And so this was one of our first uh, experiments 10 years ago around connecting physical places via digital space using a shared visual metaphor of an MIT Sloan type building with um, similar marketing collateral colors, et cetera, et cetera, to create a space in which not only remote participants, but those attending physically could interface with those who were remote. So that was 10 years ago. Five years ago, um, we continued, of course, to experiment and experiment our way forward. We uh, were creating 360 VR documentaries. Um, you can see this picture here on the, on, on the right of me um, accessing, uh, or accessing MIT, MIT Sloan, via a telepresence robot. We, we kind of plugged in a, three, a 360 video camera on top of the, of, the, of the robotic unit and kind of used it in our, our lessons and our classes to capture video 360 content, which we stitched together to create learning materials that we uploaded at the time to Oculus Go headsets and provided to participants. And again, as with all of our experiments, we have the inputs and we were very keen to see what results and insights and what outputs we would drive. And in these examples, we were able to almost move the actors and the participants and the students 
from almost a storytelling uh, metaphor to one where they were actually inside the story, to story dwelling. And I suppose as we go through today's presentation, this idea of actually moving from, moving towards a more active experience, a more immersive, a more, a more engaging experience where the actors and the, those taking part are actually on the inside and can see it from the inside out is quite an important point that I'd like you to think about. And so that brings us to today, where we continue uh, with our MIT Sloan 40X virtual collaboration space to, to deliver programs. Um, earlier today, I was delivering my office hours for my algorithmic business thinking program. And in, in fact, um, over the next couple of weeks, we'll, we'll, we look forward to contacting you and actually providing you with um, an invitation to perhaps come in to our virtual space, to this 4DX center, and have, have the opportunity to experience this firsthand. So I, I think that's a very important aspect of all of this, actually touching the technology and working with it. So these environments have provided us, and I'm sure a number of you who've experimented with them, with a flexible, scalable, personalized, persistent 24 seven type of environment that you can use in lots of different ways to enable collaboration, connection, and, and, and really foster the coming together of different groups. So let's, let's kind of just quickly though, look at the actual family of a or family of XR technologies. Um, and as, as a metaphor here, you, you can see that we have a, a, an image of a Mendeleev-esque type of person with, with, with a robot looking at a periodic table of digital and human elements. And if I take, or if we were to take the period of the XR family, there would be at least um, these, these kind of family members. So augmented reality, simply overlaying the digital content onto your real physical world content. Virtual reality, where we're actually creating a digital environment to replace or perhaps even replicate some aspect of your real world environment. Then mixed reality, where we're blending digital content into the real world to give you an environment where both coexist and interact. Virtual worlds like the 4DX space that we've mentioned, computer simulated environments where you often have many users who create their personalized avatars and use the space to connect and create, to collaborate with each other on particular activities. Um, metaverse, of, of course, a, a term that's been very much in the, in, in the public domain over the, over the last period. Um, there will be lots of different interpretations and definitions of, of, of metaverse. Perhaps one that I would feel comfortable with is it being a, a, a network of 3D virtual experiences where people can interact, work, learn, play via their avatars. So a, a network rather than a single place, a network of 3D virtual experiences. I, I have a tendency, a leaning, I think, to feel comfortable with the, the concept of or the term of a, a multiverse, simply because I know that we operate in two universes today, the, the, the physical carbon-based, as well as the digital silicon-based. And, and, and so that for me is, is a good starting point, a very practical consideration to think, well, we have multiverses today, how might they be enhanced and added to in the near, in the, in the near future? And then 360 video, uh, exactly what, what, it, what it says really, providing video with a 360 degree field of vision, um, the recording allowing you to scroll and move around different positions, see things from different perspectives, uh, different perceptions, very interesting, um, almost be able to change from being perhaps the, the person at the front who might be the expert to being having a better consideration of what the person in the audience or sitting at the table might be seeing to be able to move around different stations. Digital twins, um, a virtual representation uh, of a, a person, a, a product, a system, um, almost a, a digital counterpart that stands in for practical purposes, 
for simulations, for modeling and, and, and those, types of, those types of things. And, and, and then this point at the bottom isn't meant, to be, isn't meant to be glib, but more to come. Like Mendeleev's periodic table, we can expect there to be gaps in the family. There will be more um, family members joining XR over the next period as we develop other opportunities and develop other technologies. And, and so having introduced an, an ele some, some elements of what XR extended re reality actually is, let's spend a little bit of time thinking about and talking about why this might be relevant to you and to me today. So ultimately, um, the, the point that I would like to make here is that the, the reason why XR technologies and understand XR technologies and their application is relevant today is to a great degree because of convergence of a number of trends. And I've, I've just listed a few of them here. Um, I'm going to say a, a few words about the technology trends, the economic trends, social trends, as, as well as organizational ones. Um, but before I get into those, I, I just want to reference the image. And I apologize that this is a little bit of a busy slide, but reference the image on the right hand side, which is meant to be a skyscraper. Now, you will, I'm sure all of you or most of you be familiar with the Malcolm Gladwell kind of idea of spending 10,000 hours on something and, and gaining a certain level of expertise. Um, I think that's an interesting kind of thought model. And if, if I were to apply that to um, the 10,000 hours I kind of, or well, the first 10,000 hours I, I probably spent on AI type of technologies, and in fact, blockchain and other transformative technologies, I, I kind of came out the other side of those experiences, perhaps only with two truths, okay? That the, the first thing I, I was aware of was that I came out the other side after 10,000 hours with more questions than when I entered, okay? With more uncertainty in, in certain ways or also. So that was point number one. And the second, the second point, which I think is useful with, with regard to our conversation today about extended reality, is the delta that I saw between the technological capability of transformative technologies like machine learning, blockchain, um, blockchain stacks, extended reality. And then the user experience, the way in which our, our organizations, our teams were employing these technologies in our products, in our services, in our platforms. So I, I could see the technological capability, should we say on the 50th floor of the skyscraper, Whereas the user experience was, was often, I wouldn't say in the lobby, but, but kind of, you know, on those lower floors. I, I, I say this to kind of just make the point that there was a big gap, yeah, between the capability and the user experience. And what, what I've recognized, what I took from that was the importance in our teams and organizations of boosting and bolstering our creative quotient. Creativity is gonna be super important if we are to take advantage of the potential and the promise of the technologies, including XR, that we have at our disposal today. The danger that I see is given the speed of almost exponential growth of, um, and development of these technology stacks, if we're not careful, the distance will become so great that we will find it very, very difficult to bridge um, our user experience and our use of these the capability of these technologies for positive impact in our organizations, okay? So that's, that, that's the point I wanted to make with, with regard to the skyscraper. With regard to the trends, okay, from a technology perspective, um, apart from the most recent kind of Oculus, <coughs> Oculus kind of release, we, we're seeing AR and VR headsets often become cheaper. They're undoubtedly becoming more powerful and more capable with an improved user experience. Um, that, that combination of hardware, software, and, and in fact, user experience kind of development and acceptance of these technologies is, is, is a trend in itself. Then from an economics perspective, we're seeing the, uh, the, the, the blockchain technology and distributed ledger enabling <clears throat> digital currencies, cryptocurrencies, uh, non-fungible tokens. And, and this in itself is, is actually 
providing opportunities and new ways to, to, to own, to transact, to monetize activities with extended reality experiences. And I would argue there's also a social trend here as well, partly, partly to do with um, the way that we experienced the pandemic and kind of events of the post-pandemic period, but, but, but also I would say on a longer kind of time period or timeline, this has been coming for, 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 um, for, for five to, to, to 10 years, where our use of technologies, particularly smartphones, internet, social media, et cetera, has, has improved and enhanced our willingness and our comfort levels with immersive experience and comfort in creating communities of practice and purpose via technology and particularly persistent immersive technologies. So I think that is kind of tying in with the technology, with the economics and with the, the social elements to create a very interesting convergence of, of trends. And then for all of us who work within organizations, it's interesting to think about what's going on within our four walls and within the networks we, we operate within outside of our organizations. So not only do we need to do this thing that I'm suggesting on the right-hand side around bridging the gap between technology capability and user experience, but we also need to meet our employees and our customers where they are today in terms of the technology experiences that they're comfortable for, um, the technology experiences that they, they use in their, in their life, and not only in their work. We need to think about some of the generational kind of elements at play here as well. And fundamentally, when it comes to workforce planning, try to build a rational, sensible um, perspective around the skill sets and the capabilities that we're going to need as we move forward, not just with AI and machine learning, not just with blockchain and, and, and those uh, technology stacks, but, but also with XR. And fundamentally, my, 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 my argument is that XR will help us or is helping us with some pretty important questions, allowing us to frame some important questions and move towards their resolution or progress towards fixing some of these things. Ultimately, as I said at the beginning, I, I would, I'd like for all of us to reflect upon extended realities, not as something separate from our evolution or kind of biologically evolutionary developed cognitive reality, but something that allows us to augment, extend, expand our human experience. Um, I'm, I'm somewhat taken by the idea that as human beings, we are, um, we are somewhat plug and play. Um, this happened to me last week, um, speaking with, with my wife in, in, in the kitchen, let back my, my, my hand onto the hob, um, very quickly recoiled. Obviously, my, my, the, the sensor of, of, of my hand kind of uh, collected the data, passed the information to my, to my brain through my central nervous system, made a decision to actually tell me to move my hand super quickly away from the, the danger, so to speak. And what, what, what I see in a very simplistic manner with extended realities is the opportunity to improve the, the way in which we sense the, the, the world. You know, I, I, I sit here today only able to take in through my eyes, through the light spectrum, a very small, thin slice of, of, of reality. Um, the, my, my, my ears only, only audible kind of to such a small degree of, of, of of, of, of sounds that exist within my kind of physical in, environment. So by improving the sensors, my, my position would be that we improve our, our capability as plug and play. We're getting potentially better information, which will allow us to enhance our decision-making. In addition to that enhanced decision-making, I, I, I would argue that we have also developed evolutionary from a biological evolutionary perspective as primarily, principally 3D beings, okay? We operate in 3D, don't we? And so very often um, over the last 30 or 40 years in, in the way that computing has developed, incredibly, incredibly fantastic and unbelievable developments. But very often I still find myself interfacing with complex data in a 2D format. 
And I have to do that. It's almost a, a mental, mental trick of, uh, I remember in the old days, kind of uh, with physical maps, of having to turn the map upside down when I was driving in a car to, to be able to find my kind of destination and the route to the destination. So from a cognitive load perspective, being able to bridge from 2D into 3D, which in lots of ways is, is more natural for us, hopefully provides us with, with an opportunity for efficiencies and greater effectiveness. And then the third bullet point here, everybody, is, is a kind of a nation kind of growing um, idea that, that I have around collective reality. So I, I hope this resonates with, with, with you all, this, this idea that, uh, uh, you know, pre, particularly if we use the, the pandemic in to, 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 to kind of make this argument, that pre-pandemic, um, uh, a lot of the ways in which we interacted with kind of our, 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 um, our, our colleagues, with our customers, with our clients, was in a physical in physical manner. We would go to our, I, I would go to, to kind of uh, campus at, at, at MIT. You might go to your, your kind of offices. You might go to sister offices of the same company and you would be struck uh, by the shared identity, uh, the assets, um, the architecture, the colors, lot, lot, lots of different things were kind of put in place. Lots of investment was made to actually create a shared identity, uh, a shared backdrop to the work that we were doing. And that wasn't just for our, our kind of, for, for ourselves and our colleagues, but, but also for our clients and customers. As we actually progressed through, I, I think as we actually progressed through the pan pandemic, when we use Zoom and, and, and other collaboration tools as, as fantastic as they are, there's a danger that we are not leveraging our shared assets, whether it's those from a physical environment or not creating the equivalent in a digital set of digital spaces that allow us to actually leverage our identity and experience from an organizational perspective. And so I think extended realities as we move forward over the next period could play, might play a very interesting role in how with almost a network of networks, we, we create this collective reality and collective identity that benefits business outcomes, not, not just for, for us as employees and colleagues, but also for our clients and customers. So I, I would argue that XR, one of the important ways to look at this is as opportunity enabling. Um, it provides opportunities for ownership. Um, we, we're, we're seeing uh, almost <laughs> almost like um, back to the future again here in, in terms of Second Life and, and, and other such uh, platforms in, in, in the past, the, the opportunity to purchase um, virtual plots of land, um, the opportunity to create virtual showrooms, virtual shop fronts. Um, we're also seeing a potentiality for skills development in the areas of design and creation of XR assets to facilitate virtual experiences, whether that be, I, I tend to think of it in three E's, entertainment, enterprise, and education. Lots of opportunities here, not just to be the designers and the developers of the, of the, of the content and the assets, but to manage, to lead, and to optimize performance in each of these areas as well. And, and then one, one area that I think, another area that I think you know, it deserves um, mention, it is that there's a great opportunity here with XR, not only for a, from a, a B2C kind of consumer perspective, but also B2B, where we, we have the opportunity um, to create digital twins of, of, of products, of places, of contexts, et cetera, that mitigate or reduce the need to actually physically prototype or send out or visit kind of particular places. Uh, in, in some ways, without wishing to be uh, hyperbolic, I, I think extended reality technology, technologies provide a, an opportunity for unlocking of access, new access to consumers, to opportunities, not unlike the way that the internet did in the first instance. Um, but of course, we shouldn't be too surprised because in a number of ways, what we're talking about here is the creation of a 3D web, okay? 
So just some considerations around the opportunities that XR enables. Now, given that family of technologies, everybody, it, it will be different for all of you in terms of what buttons these technologies press, what opportunities they make even possible for you. All I'm trying to do here is whether it's in the retail, in the industrial, in the education, entertainment space, et cetera, is, is start to get you thinking even more um, about the ways in which this might be relevant or significant for your, for your teams and your organizations. Now, of course, you, you've heard me over the last kind of, particularly the last 15 minutes or so, um, talking about the potentialities and, and, and the possibilities and the promise of, of, of all of this. It's gonna be very important if we want to make significant pro, uh, progress here, that we are very aware of the reality and deal with a number of serious questions that we have in front of us. Um, it, the, the technology isn't perfect yet. It never will be, of course, and we will always be moving forward. Our user experience will always inspire um, and, and force the technology to aspire to be even better and to, and to kind of do new and bigger things, etc. But of, of course, we need, we need to work on the things like the rendering capability of various technologies. We need to work on the power consumption. We need, there are lots of aspects that need to be worked on there. So that, that's, that's a reality of a situation that we need to be aware of. Um, in terms of the, going a bit further into the question of the technology as well, we, we need to work on the accessibility. Um, interoperability is going to be key if we, if we believe in this concept of metaverses or, and or multiverses where we can move and we can transition that, for example, I have a, a digital twin or an avatar that reflects me and that digital twin or that avatar can move between different shops, different companies, different brands, different types of experiences. Well, we're going to require a set of standards and interoperability to make sure that that is done efficiently. Um, we're going to require some regulatory elements to all of this as well, if we are to deliver on the, the promise. Then dialing back a, a, a little bit, kind of getting down on, onto a personal level, um, we should be very aware of the data considerations, um, whether we're talking about wearables, whether we're talking about smart glasses, whether we're talking about um, the things that we visit, how often we visit, all of these types of things in, in virtual worlds and a, a, a lot of the data that we're creating and that will be collected will be intensely intimate and, and personal. Um, we should be mindful of data considerations irrespective of how intimate and personal the data is, of course, but we should be very sensitive to the fact that in order to build confidence, to build the trust that's gonna be required for general acceptance of these technologies, then we're gonna to have to work on these aspects. We're gonna to have to consider and grapple with the questions of, verifiable credentials, identification of community members, which spaces can we access for what reasons, when, how, and why, et cetera. And, and then with regard to our workforce, I think it's true um, that there will be lots of opportunities. The problem is we don't know, or we can't know for certain where all of these opportunities will, will kind of show themselves and in which particular roles and functions some of them are, are quite obvious in, in terms of the creation of assets, but depending on the uptake of these technologies, what are we planning? How are we thinking about our workforce? So this idea that we began with around exploring, experimenting to be able to evolve becomes incredibly important with regard to our workforce. So what are we doing today to understand the significance of potential significance of these technologies? and how they will impact our workforce. Now, this leads me in kind of just to spend a little bit of time talking about the how to apply XR. No, no, no surprises based on what you've heard me talk about for the last 40 minutes. Um, I think there has to be a very real focus on exploration, on experimentation, so that we can evolve the way that we interact collaborate, connect, communicate, et cetera, with our colleagues, but with our clients, with our customers, and the customers we haven't got yet as, as, as well. And so I, I would like to kind of pose 
five, at least five questions for, for you to, to, to think about. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's going to be very difficult to have uh, a watertight uh, XR strategy. It's going to be something that's dynamic, shape-shifting, and, and kind of evolving over the next period. But if you are prepared to experiment, or to, to explore, to experiment, and, and to evolve your practices, your policies, your, the, the way that you do business, the way that you interact in your organizations, the way you communicate, etc., then I think you'll come up with some very interesting insights that will help you and your unique reality as an organization and a set of teams be able to get the benefit of XR. So a few questions here. What are you aware? What are your competitors doing with XR today? What are your customers doing with it? Um, this strategic consideration of should you be making XR experiences, putting them into your products and services yourself, or, you, or should you be interfacing with partners who already have that skill set? Do you have the in-house skills to be able to move forward with XR to today? The, the one thing I would say is that if you decide, which is perfectly reasonable to go the buy route, uh, make sure you learn as much as you possibly can from your partners and vendors. Um, then what does extended reality and its suite of technologies actually mean for your business model? Um, what, when, when you look and see what companies like Walmart or Nike, lots of companies, what, what, what they're doing in various kind of sandbox and various, um, their various metaverses and, and virtual worlds, what implications, what are the implications for you, your strategy, your business model? And then I think a key, a key question, as digital presentists, what can I do today to explore XR? And, and you'll see in the top right-hand corner here, uh, I've included kind of uh, just as, as, as a bit of fun, uh, an, an image uh, around gaming. Um, not all of us are, are, are likely to be gamers, and that, that's perfectly fine. The, the, thing I would, the thing I would mention, though, is that whether it's board games like chess and Go and all of that, or card games, poker, et cetera, or video games, uh, whatever your preference is. Games are a very interesting, I find, organizational uh, opportunity. It's very rare in, in business or in life that we get the opportunity to practice something safely. And, and, and I find that we can actually pick games that help in certain areas and certain develop, to develop certain skills. So I, I think it's very interesting if you, if you don't game or if you haven't kind of gamed for, for, for a while, perhaps carve out a little bit of time per week just to kind of start to, to, to practice and have that safe learning experience. So with that, I, I've, I've covered those three simple questions I wanted to speak to you about today. The what is XR? Why is it relevant? And how might we get started? These, these are all questions, everybody that we delve and dive into more deeply uh, in, the, in, in the upcoming program. But, but hopefully that was an interesting kind of introduction for you. And at this point, I'll pass it back to the team and see if anybody has any questions uh, for, for, for me to try to answer. In fact, thank you everyone for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. This is uh, very provocative. And uh, I think you mentioned somewhere after 10,000 hours, you had more questions uh, than <laughs> the 10,000 hours with and after an hour we have more questions than we went in with uh, uh, as well so I'll, I'll try to summarize some of them and there's one set of questions which I think is you, know, you touched on this that you know there's a whole family of different uh, technologies that are uh, that, that, that are interrelating uh, here and contribute yeah. in, in, in different ways and there's all of this change as well so could you just sort of double click if you excuse the metaphor on on what you mentioned briefly of how do you recommend people start about start creating their strategy when there are so many unknowns and such a pace of change? I think that the, the, there are two very explicit things that, 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 that I would suggest to do. Um, the, the first one would be to take a couple of steps back and, uh, and reflect. So think about, think about almost how, how you would wish to reverse engineer your future. What, 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 what are you what are your ambitions? What are you, what are you trying to achieve? Okay, so it's very difficult, I think, to create a, 
a, a strategy for exile or transformative technologies if we go at it from a linear extension of where you are today, okay? Sometimes I think it's, it's absolutely critical to take a couple of steps back and think, well, 18 months from now, what are going to be kind of core kind of metrics of value that we need to, to, to achieve, okay? So give you, be kind to yourself. Give yourself a little bit of space. Don't try to kind of do uh, a 90-degree turn at, at, at 100 miles an hour, okay? Take, take some, some space back. And then I think the second, the second point, which is, I think, absolutely fundamental, is to, is to look at this almost like, um, like elite sports professionals. You know, they're very good at what they do every day, you know, that they have all of this talent and all of these abilities, but they still go to work every morning and try to get 0.1% better. They explore opportunities to, to, to get better. They experiment with the things that might give them that little advantage. And I think with XR technologies, probably with digital transformation in, in, in general, it's very important to have that exploration mindset to be able to kind of think, well, okay, even if it's the equivalent of training for 20 minutes a day or 10 minutes a day or an hour a week, what, what am I doing to kind of make those incremental in improvements? So check, check some things out. Go to something like uh, Frame VR, um, where you can kind of download or you can you can access, you don't even have to download it. You can access your, your, your own kind of virtual space. Invite four or five people to play around, see what happens, experiment. Start to build some intuitions. Don't buy into other people's interpretations. Experience it yourself and see, see what it feels like and see how it fits your organization and your unique reality. Great, thank you. Yeah, I, I promise to uh, get back to uh, so a more... Uh, optimistic note with, with in, in a subsequent question but there are some questions that again to paraphrase that have been uh coming in about what are some of you know you've touched on this a little bit what what are the, some of the negativities that we should be concerned about and what strategy strategies do you recommend uh to address those so um you know that includes you you touched on questions about sort of data collection and privacy and yeah. you know it's sort of like the the wealth of data that can be generated about individuals and, and, and managing that uh mm -hmm. another question which i love this phrase i haven't heard it before uh, are you worried that we might create the dopamine economy where we you know this technology becomes so good at capturing and ma maintaining the attention of human beings that it consumes us uh, in a way that's 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 not positive. And if you are concerned, what what do you recommend people are that are looking at these technologies should to do from the outset so that they're not as arguably has happened inadvertently created these creating these unintended consequences? Yeah, I think I think it's an excellent excellent question. So th th thank you thank you for that. And yes yes of course like the vast majority if not everybody on this call we we will all be concerned about this. We, we've seen we've seen um I'm not sure it's a steady kind of acceleration. We've seen an acceleration of these types of questions and concerns over the last uh, 20, 30, 40, 40 years with, as a result of various technologies um, through, through the computing age, social media, um, our tablets, smartphones, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what, 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 what to do, what to do about it? I, I think it's not so much a question of mindfulness, but being mindful, again, being able, stealing some time back to, to reflect, to do... Whenever we find ourselves going very deep into things to try and counter it with some horizontal kind of activities to try to make sure that our interactions are not only um, digital, but, but where possible and, and where kind of where useful, physical as, as well. Try to kind of pull back a, a, a little bit of balance with these things. And then, then of course, ultimately, it, it we, we all have a responsibility and anybody who works in this particular space, we, we cannot abdicate our, our responsibility to try to create the futures we kind of, we want, not just the ones that we need. So we, we need to become activists in, in, in some regards to protect the, the interests of, of, of the users and the communities and the groups. Should we can be concerned about the individualization and that dopamine kind of, yes, 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 we should. Um, putting in place kind of some guardrails and everything else is going to require a very responsible action from a number, number of groups and stakeholders. And I, I think we have to move towards that type of, that, that type of um, reality. We, we have to try to influence to get some balance, to get the required balance so that we can take the benefits 
and reduce the risks associated, Peter. Great, uh, thank you. And I think we have time to get one more question in which uh, a few people uh, clearly heard your uh, comment about you know, how, how to partner and access sort of a broader range of skills than you might have within your own organization and indeed investment. Uh, people have been commenting in the questions about, you know, how on earth do we find all the resources to, 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 to do all these experiments and this investment? Perhaps you could uh, share some thoughts about, the, from your perspective, the importance of collaboration and some advice on how, how do we need to think differently as businesses and organizations in order to, to, to generate those kinds of collaborations and succeed? So the first thing I would say, and thank you, Peter, that that's an excellent kind of range of questions as, as, as well. So I, I think that the first thing I would say is that we, we need to very much have the mindset of small, crisp, succinct experiments. OK, um, when, when we when we say experiments, we, we're not necessarily talking about kind of, you know, any any major investments. So I'm, I'm talking about hundreds, kind of low thousands of, of dollars, four weeks, six weeks. Um, small commitment in terms of a core team. I think that the, the core, one of the things that's important is to create um, experiment teams that are always from the same reporting line to have diversity and, and to almost create a team of teams. Um, identifying and, and being, and this comes back to the, the idea of playing games actually, kind of knowing, knowing where your strengths are, knowing where your weaknesses are. If you think back to kind of when, when you know, if, you, if, you, if you're a if you're a gamer or if kind of you've played chess and all the rest of it, you, one of the great things about or sports even, they they kind of they bring you back they bring you down to earth pretty pretty quickly. Yeah? You you learn what you're good at and what you're not not good at, and and so where where you have gaps in your abilities as an organisation, experiment with a with a partner or a vendor who clearly has that expertise, but do so do so in a way where they are transparent and you have the opportunity to learn. Yeah, to learn uh, quickly from them and make sure, same as any type of learning, and Peter, you'll be pleased to, to hear me say this, it's not the learning itself, it's what you do with it, okay? So when you run these experiments or when you interact with these partners or these vendors, that the learnings that, that you take, how are you applying them to create value in adjacent or other, other areas? How, how, how are you collecting? How are you making sure that that, that those insights become part of your collective intelligence, your collective identity, and can be reused. Okay, so I think pragmatic, practical steps is is, is the way forward. Great, thank you, Paul. I think that's excellent advice, uh, and just brings us nicely to the top of the uh, hour. So, thank you so much, Paul McDonough Smith, for sharing uh, your thoughts about this topic and information about your upcoming course. And thank you all for. For joining us. Uh, I hope you, uh, many of you will be able to join us for future webinars in our Innovation at Work webinar series. I don't know, perhaps we've got a slide uh, to, to close on that might have some information about upcoming uh, webinars. Uh, here we go. It's why strategy matters uh, for startups. Uh, so whether you're in a startup or you're in a large company, this is actually quite a, a, an interesting topic. Uh, this is a very important part of the uh, sector of the economy. So uh, hopefully I'll see many of you again uh, in on November the 9th, uh, or my colleagues will see you, I should say, on November the 9th for that, uh, for that webinar. Uh, once again, thank you, Paul McDonough-Smith, Senior Lecturer at MIT Stone School. Uh, thank you all of you for joining us, and we'll see you again soon. In the meantime, keep on innovating. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>